Well, good morning to you. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us. Uh, I would encourage you to, to keep praying, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, let's pray that, that all of this will end soon and we can be back together um, in, in a custom that we're, a fashion, that we're, fat, that we're used to. Um, but we need to put our confidence in God and let's be persistent in prayer and let's continue to fill our minds with godly things and let's use these opportunities as God is blessing us with right now to get stronger and, and continue to just do good. Um, as we begin this morning, I want to do something just a little bit differently. I'd like to, to ask my dad, if he would, to lead us in a few songs that I've asked him uh, to pick out for us. Um, hopefully you and your family are gathered together this morning to worship. So sing along. I've asked him to pick out songs that are familiar to you. Uh, so dad, if you would come in and lead us in those songs, um, please. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Every day, Lord, oh, I need you. In my home, Lord, alleluia. Every day, Lord, oh, I need you. I am yours, Lord, alleluia. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and Reach to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. He's my Savior, my Redeemer. How He loves me, how I love Him. He is risen, He is coming, Lord, come quickly, Alleluia. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Comfort I get from God's own word. Seeking a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? My fear is grand, with friends I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Oh, where could I go, seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end? Where could I go but to the Lord? I appreciate that, Dad. Thanks a lot, and I hope that 
you were able uh, to sing along with that this morning as, as we're doing our very best in whatever way possible to, to praise our God. And, and I know that, that he is certainly pleased with those things. You know, so over the last a few weeks, as we've been living in really these most unusual circumstances, we've been doing our, our very best to wade through these, thing, these things. And, and we've talked a lot about God and, and this idea of bringing gods to our minds and allowing God to, to dominate our perspective. And we've looked at passages like Psalm 46, this idea of stillness through a knowledge of God and who God is and what he's capable of. And from passages like Philippians chapter four, this idea of giving our cares and anxiety to God with this incredible promise of, of peace through our Lord. And this idea of filling our minds constantly with God and his word from, from passages like Philippians chapter four at verse eight. And we've been emphasizing this idea that, that God and only God brings certainty to uncertainty and the hope that he provides in Christ Jesus, brethren, it is certain uh, for the faithful. Passages like Romans chapter eight reminds us that there are no circumstances that can separate us, the faithful, uh, from the love of Christ. And I would just continue to encourage you, brethren, let's cling to God, let's run to God, let's trust God, let's be still and have peace in God, a caring and, and a most capable God. You know, this stillness and this peace that we've been emphasizing is rooted in the idea that we can trust God. It's the idea that by his very nature, as we're reminded in Hebrews chapter 6 at verse 18, that God cannot lie. So we can have faith in God. And brethren, we can trust our God. But as we're getting back to, to really these most fundamental truths, I want to turn all of this around on us. And, and yes, it's true. God, no doubt, is our certainty in uncertainty. And, and we can expect with 100% confidence that, that he's going to give us everything that we need. We can have 100% confidence that he's going to re reward the faithful with eternal salvation. But let's turn this around. Brethren and friends, what about us? What does God expect from us. Uh, certainly not limited uh, to times like these, but, but certainly included um, in times such as these. You know, for the members here at Kenwood, our Bible reading this year is centered on godly men and women of Scripture, and we're trying our, our very best to see the circumstances and events uh, of their life, and just really these overall life happenings that are recorded in Scripture through these real men and women that God uses, and we're asking ourselves, what did they do right, and, and what did they do wrong, and, and what would I have done if I would have been faced with a situation such as that? And, and we were asking ourselves, what is God teaching us uh, about himself uh, through them? And for the last several weeks, we've been looking at the man of God, uh, Moses, a man whom God used in really a most extraordinary way to accomplish his ultimate will. And, and this coming week, after reading about that generation that, re that rebelled and, and really failed to trust God and put their faith in God, and as a result, as we've read, they, they would perish in the wilderness and they would never see the promised land. Uh, next week, we're going to spend some time in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, that word means the second giving of the law, and, and this would be for that next generation. And I would encourage you this morning, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn over to the book of Deuteronomy in your Old Testament. That's where we're going to spend the majority of our time for our message this morning. It's in the book of Deuteronomy that, that Moses is going to give a series of sermons or, or speeches where he's going to give this next generation a history lesson. And he's going to remind them of what God had done for them and ultimately what the proper response to all of this was. He's going to prepare them for their new home as, as they'll enter the promised land under the leadership of Joshua with God ultimately guiding and delivering them. And there's a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 10 that I want to explore with you this morning. I think in times like these, it's critical for us as the people of God to be reminded of some most fundamental things. We need to get back to the fundamentals, especially in times like this. And I believe 
in this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 10, it tells us exactly what God expected out of these people. And, and while I realized that this was written for them in a, in a specific time and place, I would argue that these expectations, brethren, are found throughout our, our New Testaments. So I want you to listen to Moses. If you have your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 10, let's begin reading at verse 12, please. The Bible says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I am commanding you today for your good. Brethren and friends, I want us to examine and to appreciate the question that is asked here. Israel, what does the Lord require from you? Or, or, or what does God expect from you? Number one, back in verse 12, he says, fear the Lord your God. For those of you who are members at Kenwood, you know how often this idea of fearing God or walking in the fear of the Lord, how often and frequent it comes up in our studies. The fear of God is, is most fundamental to our faith, and it's something that the Bible emphasizes and brings up constantly, directly, or, or even indirectly, I would argue. You know, to fear God at its most basic level is to respect God. It's to stand in awe of God, and as we come to a better understanding of who God is and what he's capable and, and, and what he's done for us and what he's prepared for the faithful, I think the good and honest heart marvels at his power and we stand in awe of, of his love and his mercy and his grace. But this idea of fearing God, brethren, there's another side of the coin that, that's not as pleasant to acknowledge or even think about. You know, as Romans chapter 15 at verse 4 reminds us, the word of God, our, our Old Testaments, they provide us with a record of God's dealing with man. And, and we can read of God's reaction to disobedience. And we come to a knowledge of his divine and and even perfect wrath in the face of rebellion and disrespect of him and his words. So when we talk about fearing the Lord, we're talking about this reverential respect for God, included, though, a fear of displeasing him in light of his mercy, in light of his grace, but also this fear of displeasing him in light of his justice, in light of his divine and perfect wrath, in light of punishment by way of disobedience, punishment for those who disregard him, eternal punishment for that matter. Brethren, we can't ignore that. You know, as I've said a million times and will continue to say, if we could get this most fundamental attitude right, if one's attitude towards God and his word are right, brethren, everything else falls in place. You know, the wise man in Proverbs 1 would speak to the necessity of this most basic way of viewing God and, and really viewing ourselves in light of God. If you have your Bibles, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, the wise man would say this, the fear of the Lord, he says, is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You know, when a person comes to the realization of who God is, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience, this idea that our God that we pray to, this God that we serve, the creator, the sustainer, he is all powerful. And he's an all seeing God and he's an all knowing God. And when the honest heart comes to that acknowledgement, that person humbles himself under the direction of God. And he listens when he speaks. And I would argue that only a fool would disregard the instruction of our God, but it doesn't stop there. But then let's ask the question, what are the fruits? How does this type of attitude, an attitude of fear towards God that he expected of these people, and I would argue expects of us today, how does it ultimately manifest itself in one's life? What does it look like? You know, Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes, he conducts this all-encompassing experiment with all of the world's resources at his disposal in search of the meaning of this life, as he would say, this life under the sun. And with all of these earthly possibilities that, that he had, he tests 
this in search of meaning. And for, for most of the book of Ecclesiastes, it's kind of a depressing read as he discovers that the things of this earth, uh, apart from God, are, are simply vanity. They're, they're meaningless. But if you fast forward to the last chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, here's what he discovers. And, and let me just say this. I think this passage right here is most is, a, is really a most relevant starting point for so many people right now as they're facing the uncertainty of the things that they've spent their entire lives working for and investing in. And so many people, unfortunately, are watching so many of these things crumble before their eyes, and they're coming possibly to the understanding that maybe there's more to all of this. Maybe my purpose in this life is greater than this. You know, I would encourage you to have this passage on the tip of your tongues in coming days by way of conversation starters with those who previously may have not had much of an interest in any type of religious things. Listen to Solomon's conclusion in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 at verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12 at verse 13, Solomon says this, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God, keep his commandments. Because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You know, a mind that is characterized by godly fear, this proper respect, proper appreciation, this healthy dread of, of God's divine wrath. Brethren and friends, it manifests itself in obedience. And let's not miss this. Brethren, there's consequences to disobeying God. You know, think about the example of what we read this past week in, in Numbers 13 and 14. But brethren, when we consider what God has done for us and, and all that he's provided for us, our daily provisions, our spiritual provisions in Christ Jesus, does it not beg the question for the honest and rational mind this morning? In light of all of those things, why wouldn't we want to obey him? You know, we'll reference this verse more than once this morning, but I want you to look back at verse 13 of our text in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Brethren and friends, we can never forget this. Parents, we must emphasize this uh, to our children. Deuteronomy 10 at verse 13, Moses says, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes. But listen to this last part, which I'm commanding you today for your good. God's statutes, his commandments, his word, they are for our good and for the person who has the proper fear of God in their hearts. They understand that God is for us. They understand that he would never steer us wrong. They understand that as a result of their respect for him and who he is and what he's done and what he's promised, that his commandments, brethren and friends, are ultimately for our best. Israel, what does the Lord require from you? Fear the Lord your God. And then he says this, walk in all his ways. That's back in verse 12. You know, to walk in scripture is to live. It's a way of life. And God's word uses this idea to describe a person's way of doing things, their conduct, their behavior, their manner of life. And scripture tells us that, that men like Noah and, and men like Enoch of old, they walked with God. And I think it's important for us to accept that all of us in this life, we have a choice. We choose the way that we're going to live. We choose whom and what we are going to live for. And there's a walk that God is pleased with. And there's a manner of life that God is pleased with. And scripture by grace makes clear that there's a distinct difference in these choices. You know, talk. Talk is cheap. You see, it's not enough for one to express one's love for God. It's not enough to say, I'm a Christian. Brethren and friends, our manner of life, our walk ought to reflect it. And let's be clear, I'm not setting us up for disappointment and suggesting that, that God demands a sinless life. We'd all be in trouble, but that should be our goal. Brethren, we know that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. But it's insulting to God when we claim to have a relationship with him but walk in a way that we know is not pleasing to him. In fact, it's hypocritical. You know, the Apostle John talks about fellowship with God, and ultimately, I think that's what we all want. We want an, an eternal relationship 
with God. And we won't take the time to explore every aspect of, of this verse that I'm going to bring to your attention. We'll do that another time. But if you have your Bibles in 1 John chapter 1, I want you to listen to what the Apostle John, led by the Holy Spirit, would say in regards to this idea of being in fellowship with God, a relationship with God. 1 John chapter 1 at verse 5, he says this, this is the message that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we don't have, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Brethren and friends, God is light. He is righteous. He is truth. It is insulting to our God when we profess one thing and live another. Let's get this. Fellowship with God. It requires us to walk in light. And that's a reasonable requirement. It requires us to pursue righteousness with everything we have, as Jesus commands us in Matthew chapter 5 at verse 6. Israel, what does the Lord require from you? Fear the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. And then he says this, and love him. Brethren and friends, we should swell with gratitude when we confront our minds with God's love. You know, apart from the love of God, we're, we're stuck with this earthly existence with nothing of eternal substance to look forward to. And apart from the love of God, we're, we're stuck in the disappointment and the burden that comes with carrying around our, our sins and the guilt that comes with them. You know, I would argue that God's history with us is him proactively acting in our best interest 100% of the time. He loves us, and he's proven again and again. The ultimate proof being the sending of his son to die on the cross for mine and your sins. The Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3 at verse 16, he would say, we know love by this that he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, I would argue, brethren and friends, it shouldn't be hard for us to love God. That shouldn't be a stretch for us. But it's more than just a mental assertion. It's more than just a good tingly feeling. So what's it look like? It's not enough just to say, yeah, I love God. You know, in John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus would say, if you love me, keep my commandments. First John chapter five and verse three, the apostle John says, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And then he says, and his commandments are not burdensome. You know, I go back to verse 13 again in our text is John, he's just reminded us that his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, they're for us, they're for our good. And I want you to listen to Moses once more. Let's bring verse 13 in again. And to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today. And he says, for your good. Brethren, let's make this connection. To love God is to obey God. And let's never forget that. Israel, what does the Lord require from you? Fear the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Love him who first loved you. And then number four, he says, serve the Lord, in the verse 12, with all your heart and with all your soul. You know, brethren, to serve is to work for. It's, it's to wait upon. To be a servant requires humility. You know, Jesus, he came to serve. And one of his last impressions that he would leave with his apostles was a picture of him washing their feet in an act of service in John chapter 13. Let me ask you a most basic question this morning. Whom or what are you currently serving? As you're considering that question this morning, I want you to hear what Jesus says in regards to this idea. 
In Matthew chapter 6 at verse 24, listen to what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 6 at verse 24, the Bible says no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. You know, brethren, too often we have convinced ourselves that we can do both, that we can straddle that fence between God and, and stuff, God and self, God and money, as Jesus brings up here in Matthew chapter 6 at verse 24. And we straddle this fence and we think, you know what, well, God's pleased. And, and we measure ourselves by others. But not according to Jesus. Jesus says, choose. You know, Paul, Paul he, he speaks to this truth as well in Romans chapter 6, that, that ultimately we're serving one or the other. He puts it in a little different way. In Romans chapter 6 at verse 13, the apostle Paul says, or I should say verse 16, Romans 6 at verse 16, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, listen to this, resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. You see, there's an end to these decisions of whom we're going to be a slave to, whom we're going to serve. But then he says in verse 17, but thanks be to God that through you were, that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Brethren and friends, ask yourselves this morning, whom or what are you ultimately serving? You know, God demands our all. He demands our full devotion. He has every right to demand that of us. You know, Moses here, he talks about a passionate service to God, serving him with everything that we have, not half-hearted service. And I'll add another layer to this. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2 at verse 10, it tells us that we are saved to do good, saved to serve, you might say. And Paul expresses this truth again in Galatians chapter 5 at verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, Paul says, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law, verse 14, is fulfilled in one word. In a statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Scripture, God in flesh equates service to him, service to God, to service to others. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25, as we've been looking um, at, at parts of this chapter as a congregation on and off this year by way of our theme, uh, this idea of godly stewardship. It's a chapter that's focused largely on the judgment that is coming for every a single one of us, this accounting that all of us are going to give when our Lord returns. And I want you to listen to Jesus as we close. This idea of serving God being equated to serving Others. And in Matthew chapter 25 at verse 31, listen to Jesus. The Bible says, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left and the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35 says, for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in, naked, and you clothed me, sick, and you visited me in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? feed you, or, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And, and when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer, verse 40, and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, he says, you did it to me. And then we get to verse 41, and he will also say to those on his left, depart from me. Cursed ones into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devils 
and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. A stranger, and you didn't invite me in. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. And they themselves, verse 44, also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? And he will answer them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, listen to this, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Brethren, I would encourage you, let's take this to heart. Israel, what does the Lord expect from you? What does the Lord require from you? Brethren, these are fundamental things that ought to describe us. Fear the Lord your God. Walk in all his ways. Love him, the one who has first loved you. And serve the Lord with everything we've got. I pray that this message has been helpful. I pray that you were encouraged by uh, the songs that were led at the beginning of this message. Let's be strong. Let's be courageous. Let's be persistent in prayer. Let's be persistent in study. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you have questions, I would encourage you and direct you. Go to our website, www.kimwoodchurchofchrist.com. Dot com. Our contact information is there. Contact us. We would love nothing more than to study with you. If you are not a Christian, I would encourage you to seek out God's Word. God's Word is plain by way of His salvation for us and what He expects in light of His grace. And if you are not a Christian, I would encourage you, go to that website. Seek one of us out. Let us study with you. And if you're listening to this message this morning and you know your life is not right with God, I would encourage you to contact, if you're a member at the, at the church there, contact us, brethren, and let us be there for you. Let us pray for you. Let, let, let's be there for one another. Let's make sure that we're all right with God. He deserves that. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, thank you Father, for your love, thank you for your mercy, thank you for your grace. Father, we sin, and we have all fallen short of your glory. And if not for your love and mercy and grace, Father, we would be most miserable. But we have hope as a result of you, and we are so thankful. Father, help us to allow your love and your mercy and grace to motivate us to live for you. Father, to see your requirements, to see your commandments as those things that are best for us, understanding then that you would never steer us in the wrong direction, but that you are for us and your word is for us. Father, we pray for those that are hurting. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for our nation. We pray for our elders. Father, be with them and be with their families. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. But Father, we pray if there are those who are listening to this message this morning that are not right with God, Father, we pray that they would take the necessary steps to make their lives right with God, even this very day. Give them the courage and the strength to do that, Father. We love you. We're thankful for you. And Father, we ask for your, contended, for your continued blessings, your continued protection, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.